glad to be in the house of the Lord. How many are you glad to Amen. be in the house of the Lord? Okay. So we're going to have to put up with masks for a while. Amen. Uh, this might be kind of uh, going into the fall and everything else. Things aren't looking real good with the numbers. And so... Um, but we'll keep maintaining the way we can. Uh, there are a lot of people that don't want to come with masks on, so uh, that's, I guess, understood. So we're putting things online, but that's really not church. Uh, you don't feel the same. Uh, it'll never replace fellowship, even though we're at a distance here. Uh, so uh, let's begin with a little word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for... The fact that we have the Lord's Day, it's a time of celebration. We celebrate the resurrection, that glorious day that you defeated death and disease and hell itself and came to give us eternal life. We ask your blessing upon each that have arrived here. We're thankful, Lord, that you have preserved us from this dreaded plague. We pray, Father, that you would remember those that are about us and especially the unsaved. I pray in hours like this, Lord, when our nation is being tested, that they would would turn to Jesus Christ. Uh, every nation, every kingdom of this world is going to come to an end, but you have an everlasting kingdom that you promised that you would bring from heaven to earth. And when that happens, Lord, there'll be no more plagues, there'll be no more wars, there'll be no more uh, bigotry and hatred and riots. Uh, it's going to be a peaceful kingdom, and you will reign forever and ever. We're looking forward to that kingdom, Lord. Amen. So this morning we're practicing. Uh, we're not in the kingdom yet, but we're practicing as though we were. So uh, bless our meeting today. Uh, touch each one of our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. And the people said, Amen. All right. Now, you know, it's uh, Fourth of July uh, weekend coming up. Normally, this would have been the morning that we did I Love America. So we're going to uh, plug in a few political uh, government uh, uh, statements a little later on. And we are certainly going to uh, celebrate the greatest country on earth, America, Amen. the beautiful.
great to be an American. It truly is nothing like this country. There are people who want to tear it down, start all over again with their nonsense, but greatest country in the world. Amen. Be glad you were born here. Be glad that you live here. Amen. Well, I need to make some announcements. Uh, you know, it's amazing what one week can do to alter your lives. I say it all the time. We don't know what's going to happen next. You don't know what's growing in you. I don't know what's growing in me. Uh, life is a fragile equation. So we found out this week that my wife had a 99% blockage in her right coronary artery. Uh, and she had symptoms for the last month or so. Um, and finally, chest pains that wouldn't go away. So we decided uh, we needed to get down. So uh, Wednesday night, I took her down to Wednesday afternoon, I took her to Shadyside Hospital. For evaluation, they uh, decided to keep her, and they, they did a stress test, uh, which was abnormal. And then they actually did a uh, uh, heart catheterization on Friday. So, um, and all is well. And we thank God for uh, the very competent people at Shady Side Hospital uh, that helped us through all of this, and uh, certainly uh, also your prayers. Uh, there was a complication, and the complication was they went in, rather than using the femoral artery, they actually went in, and they're doing this now through your wrist. Uh, so the radial artery, um, once they pull out, they uh, put a clamp on you, and the clamp uh, is to uh, cauterize the wound so that ultimately the blood clots around it, and uh, they can take that off. When they began to remove it, she lost a lot of blood. It was a pretty bad scene. And they called in what they call the, the crash cart. Um, and they, uh, well, they had to uh, uh, get her ready in, in the event of a major event. So um, that's why you want to go to a, uh, a city hospital, preferably Presbyterian or Shady Side, something like that, because the suburban hospitals, I don't think they're equipped like this. Yeah. So I was really amazed at how quickly they were able to bring all these uh, people. They had a team assembled almost immediately that showed up. It must have been 20 people in the room. They tried to usher me out, of course, and I said, uh, we're not going anywhere. Yeah. So um, they said, well, this might not. I said, uh, I'm ready for any trauma. We're, we're fine. We're prepared. And I just have to say that the peace of God was with us. Uh, we didn't feel anxiety. I was looking at my wife all the time, and she was fine uh, with it. Um, she almost passed out, obviously, from the loss of blood and some other uh, circumstances. But we weren't afraid. And that's just what I want to emphasize. The peace of God is um, palpable in a moment like that. And I understand why they want to usher me out of the room, uh, because most people would not be able to tolerate the scene. But uh, we're ready for whatever God brings to us, Amen. life or death. Amen. So we're ready. Amen. So it wasn't something uh, that I needed uh, uh, to rethink. I knew I, I needed to be there because while they're doing their work, I'm doing mine. So we're praying and we're talking to the Lord, and we got the answers. We got beautiful answers. And uh, they were able finally to, uh, after much um, pressure they placed on her, and reclamped her. Uh, they were able to come in. The surgeon came right in. Uh, he was an excellent surgeon. They call him Dr. T. Um, and he just did a great job. So we were satisfied uh, beyond uh, our wildest imagination. So we are overwhelmed, of course, with the prayers and the love and the support of uh, faithful people. So many of you texted and called and um, it was beautiful to have that, to feel that, and to sense that all around us. Um, and of course, the Lord himself was there. Amen. So he was holding us by the right hand Amen. and took us right through all of this. And uh, so we just want to express our love. Um, my wife, uh, we were able to finally extricate her from the hospital uh, last night. Uh, and they were a bit reluctant. They didn't want her to go home. They wanted to observe her one more night. But uh, everything was fine. She's... Uh, uh, desperately wanted to come home. You know, they have these, uh, the uh, heart unit where we were, uh, they don't have showers in the uh, rooms. So uh, no shower was available. So for four days, <laughs> no uh, shower. So you feel so yucky and so on. And um, 
uh, sleeping in a recliner for me uh, was not the best thing, to say the least, hard on my back and so forth. But uh, after the whole event, you'd have to say, well, you know, we have it so much better than third world countries, or in some cases, suburban hospitals. So we were really glad to be where we were, and I highly advise everybody, when you have an event, to seek out a major hospital, uh, even though it means you have to pay for parking and so forth. It was $16 for parking and so on. You know, that's expensive stuff, but it's well, well worth it uh, to do that. So keep all that in mind, because everybody here is going to have an event, just in case you're wondering. We all get something, and you never know when it's going to strike. As I said, uh, last week we would have never predicted that we were going to be in the hospital and doing this. So, uh, And you don't know what's going to happen to you. Uh, isn't it great to know that God has us in the hollow of his hand, and whatever happens, it all works together for good. So God knows what he's doing, and he loves his children. He takes care of his own. All right, so blessings to all of you. Thank you for uh, the support we felt, and uh, it was uh, uh, a beautiful time. That's what we have to say. All right, some uh, other announcements. First of all, um, we have some hymnals and Bibles uh, that we've taken out of the pews intentionally and placed them over to the side. And some of you have been going over and taking and lifting. We don't want anybody touching those. Again, we don't know and you don't know who has the virus and who's spreading these things and so on. So uh, we really don't want anybody using those. So we have them over in the corner here and we didn't think anybody would go near them, but somehow people do what they want to do. and. So and so please, uh, and through all of this that we're going through, please just honor what the rules are. Instead of deciding that you don't need this or you don't want this, this is, this, you're going to have to learn. We have to learn at some point some obedience, and you just do uh, at this point what we have to do to get through this time. This is not going to be forever. And they're going to come up with some kind of a vaccine, I suppose. And if you don't want to take it, you don't have to take it. But... Uh, as far as the community is concerned, we have obligations and we want to do our very best. I don't want anybody getting this stuff, especially don't want you to get it here in this auditorium. So that's the way it works. Okay, so just be kind. And, and six feet's very important too. And I notice, you know, some of you aren't six feet apart here and uh, uh, you should be six feet apart. Uh, so if somebody's sitting in front of you, you shouldn't that's no good. Uh, you have to be at least uh, opposite rows and so forth. Now, if your family, I'm not worried about it, you know, uh, you sit with each other, that's fine. You all have it. <laughs> that's the way it goes. But we, uh, otherwise, you need to sit six feet apart. So remember that and keep that in mind. I think the ushers are doing what they can to try to seat people. So again, just be compliant at this juncture. It, uh, it, it's helpful to me. Uh, we're trying to do something that we believe is right and reasonable. And we're just glad that we're able to meet again because this was a terrible time. I've never done this in all my years of ministry that we, uh, you know, I might have missed a Sunday here or there. I, I can't believe three months elapsed. But uh, these are unusual times, very strange times. Now, Wednesday night, we're having a service as well. I'd encourage you to come back. There's plenty of room in the auditorium for people. And I think you need to be at church. And uh, I, I say almost facetiously, what else do we have to do at this point? Uh, a lot of things are closed down. You can't do much. But we just started a study in the book of Job. It's a fascinating book. And I know that you're going to get a lot out of it. It's a very deep book. It's an intentionally deep book. And uh, I think it's an amazing uh, scripture because in it, God answers some of the most difficult questions that mankind has ever asked. And uh, we, we stand in awe of this book. So I want you to come on Wednesday nights. We start at 7 and we will be over at 8. And whatever service you come to, I want you to come back tonight. We start at 6.30 tonight. Uh, every service will only be an hour in duration. So uh, you want to get here and be here 15 minutes ahead of time so you don't miss any part of the service. And we'll appreciate all that and your cooperation is uh, deeply appreciated. I don't know if you knew this or not, but Dr. Fauci announces that there's a new mask that will save thousands of lives. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> also, I don't know, some of you it might be speeding a bit and so forth, but there's a new way to avoid uh, speeding tickets. <laughs> Just carry that sign with you. That'll, that'll do it right there. Other people have the novel mask that they've been using to fight the virus, but uh, I don't know how effective that one's going to be. And uh, this fellow was uh, decided to clean his TV screen with antivirus wipes. And so he lost CNN, MSNBC, NBC, ABC, and CBS. Those are all enemies to the truth, just so you know that. They're total enemies. And they are part of the destruction of this country. Amen. And that's what they are all about, the radicals. And they intend to bring it down. You may like uh, David, what's his name, Muir. And you may like uh, George Stephanopoulos, but these people are uh, just apparatchiks for the Democrat Party and for the overthrow of our country. So tune them out, folks. And Fox is getting right behind them at this point. Uh, you've, got, uh, you've got swamp creatures running Fox. So you say, where are we going to get our news? Uh, here's news right here. This is good news. So stay with this news, and uh, you won't have anything to worry about. So join us again tonight. We'll be glad to do so. Um, I'm going to ask, is Esther here this morning? Uh, she's going to sing for us uh, the Star Spangled Banner from I Love America. I figured we'd at least have one song here tonight, uh, today. You know, what's going on in America is a shame. These are anarchists. And uh, here they've co-opted what I think are legitimate protests about police brutality, at least in the particular case where they murdered a man uh, unnecessarily. Uh, and it's an abysmal shame that such a thing should happen. And we are completely against what that officer did. Uh, but it's not easy being a police officer, and most of the police officers, uh, I, the vast majority of them are good people, and uh, they don't want to do this anymore, and they denounce what that one officer did. So, uh, But uh, that's just an excuse for anarchists now to come in and try to d divide our country and tear it apart and burn the American flag, which is uh, such a reproach to me. So um, the Bible speaks of these days that we're living in. Uh, Jude and Second Peter 2 uh, both address the, uh, uh, these people, these types of people, but chiefly them that are walking after their own flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. If you, if you track history, you're going to see that uh, during the Bolshevik Revolution, it was the same uh, nonsense and the same uh, things, you know, uh, they were working for the the laboring people, and, and uh, that was the idea of it. But uh, once the Marxists take control, it's the elite that live high off the hog, and they uh, subjugate the rest of the population. It's never worked. It never will work. Socialism is a bane to society. You don't want it, no matter what brand. Uh, now they're calling it democratic socialism. It's, uh, it's rot, and uh, you want to be uh, make, making sure to keep our liberties, maintain them. So, um, good way to start the uh, celebrations. Amen. All right, we're in our Bibles at the 18th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 18, and we're at the, the rich young ruler. But before we get to that, there's some, um, a little preface here from, uh, it's kind of a repeated lesson that we had a few chapters back. So I'm going to start at the 15th verse. They brought unto him uh, also infants. So we, we have the, uh, the case here of Jesus who loves the little children. We know that. And infants in particular. So here's that uh, Greek word, briefos. So the, uh, the infants that he cared about. Well, yeah, I'm, i got to reset my... <laughs> so the, uh, these are infants. They're little babies. So the Lord loves them. That's why we've got to protect them while they're in the womb. Because God does love them, and he has all their members written down in his book, which is the book of life. And it's not until later in life that a person becomes cognizant of, of, of right and wrong and then begins to rebel against God, and their names then are, are, are erased from the book of life. But thank God they can be written again with the blood of Jesus Christ. So uh, that's what it's all about. God loves the little children, and Jesus is demonstrating that here in our text. 
But uh, when the disciples saw that, they rebuked the, the people. They were trying to protect Jesus. Don't bring all those little kids up here and so forth. But Jesus wasn't annoyed by them. He loved them and uh, he gladly embraced them and uh, blessed them. So Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me. Forbid them not for such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter in. Then said he unto the disciples, it is impossible, but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. So we learned this lesson before in the 17th chapter, and it's just a repetition here. Uh, so it demonstrates when, whenever the Bible repeats something, it must be an important lesson and something that all of us are supposed to take special note of. So the, uh, the Lord here speaks about letting the little children come because such is the kingdom of God. And those that offend them will be cast out of the kingdom of God. In fact, he says it would be better than a millstone were hung about their neck. Now this is, you might say hyperbole, but he's really talking about eternal damnation. That people that murder little babies are going to go to hell for murdering them. And governments that permit it also are going to have to be accountable to God. And political parties, that uh, that's one of their main platforms is to kill babies. They're going to have to answer to God for what they did and for the Holocaust that has happened in our country since 1973. And uh, God have mercy upon the souls of these Supreme Court justices that have permitted this lawlessness and murder and bloodshed to continue on. So uh, the Lord said it would be better that they were cast into the sea with a millstone hung about their neck if they should offend one of these little ones. So let's make sure that all of us are not an offense to any little ones. That we're not a stumbling block because of our hypocrisy. Because of the language that we use. Because people look and say, well, he's a Christian. And then uh, we're doing just the opposite. Cheating, lying, stealing, whatever it might be. We're supposed to be exemplars to little ones so that they can follow us and they can say, this is the way, walk ye in it. So uh, let us all play our part here to be uh, influencers for righteousness and let little ones be able to look up to us. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're just a, you're a Sunday school teacher or you're a pastor. Every Christian should be a light to the world and little ones should be able to see the truth of our faith lived out in us. In the more extended lesson in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus speaks of these little ones which believe in me, which demonstrates that they already have this innate innocence. They belong to God as they are. It's not till later in life that they become accountable. Somewhere probably in their teen years that they will then become accountable and have to stand before the Lord. So indeed, Jesus loves the little children of the world. So we're now at the 18th verse and now we're speaking about the, uh, a different lesson. And this lesson has to do with a certain rich ruler Matthew tells us that he's a young man, so he must have inherited the wealth. It takes a, a long while, especially in the first century and in an agrarian society, to become wealthy. So he must have inherited that. And that is pretty much seen out in the fact that he's looking for one more aspect of the inheritance. So he's coming to see Jesus here, and a certain rich ruler asks him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I would have to call that a great question, and a very important one. This rich ruler that came to Jesus uh, runs to him. So there are a lot of things that recommend the, the rich young ruler. Uh, we look at him and say, you know, he, he understood who Jesus was, at least in some aspect. He knew him to be a good teacher. That's all the word good master means, that he was a good teacher. Uh, anybody would have had to have admitted that, a good teacher, but that's not enough to save you that Jesus taught good lessons. Why, Thomas Jefferson believed that, but he didn't believe that Jesus was God. That didn't do Thomas Jefferson any good when he died and had to stand before his maker, or Ben Franklin or some of the other founding fathers. They were deists. They were not Christians. So it won't do them any good, I tell you. It didn't do this man any good either, just to acknowledge Jesus as a good teacher. Anybody that reads the writings of Jesus would have to acknowledge that he was the best teacher that ever walked the earth. But he came and he's come, he came running to Jesus. I think that's the best way to come to Jesus, come running. Uh, no delays, because you don't know what life will bring. Uh, life is ephemeral. We're here for a moment, we're gone. The Bible says, your life is like a vapor. It appeareth for a little time and then it vanisheth away. Life, as I say, is evanescent. 
So we better be ready to meet our maker. And when the opportunity comes, you better run to find Jesus. It's time to find him. By the end of this chapter, we'll find another man blind. His name was Bartimaeus. And as he sensed that something exciting was happening, he asked what the issues were. They said, well, it's Jesus of Nazareth. And he, he's passing by. And when he heard that, he shouted out for mercy. He knew he had only one shot here. And uh, so likewise, I think the rich ruler running to Jesus, he runs down and says he kneels to him. So he kneels down as a demonstration of obeisance. Uh, he knows and acknowledges uh, that Jesus is uh, certainly a grade above any other teacher that he had ever met. And he asked him, so he had questions. So there's lots to learn about him. He's rich, first of all. He's young, according to Matthew's account. He's powerful because he's a ruler. So he has a station in life, as it were. And we notice here, if he's kneeling down, he's, at least he's demonstrating a spirit of worship. He's inquisitive. He asked him. He had a question that he wanted to bring forth. He was observant because he says, well, all these have I kept. I've uh, kept all the commandments. And uh, he was lost. So it can have all those other qualities, and you can still go to hell. People can be very religious and be lost. And this is one illustration of many in the Bible of a person that kept the commandments. If you ask most people today, if they think they're going to heaven, they'll say, yeah, well, I'm a good person and I try to stay by the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule. But that won't be enough to get you there. And you know what? This rich young ruler knew that. Why else would he come to Jesus with this particular question? What must I do to inherit eternal life? He must have recognized that with all that he did in keeping the law, he was still devoid of eternal life. He needed something more. So a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, this um, question, I'd have to say, is the greatest question was ever asked. Well, there are other great questions in the Bible that people ask, but... It certainly uh, is a question that every human being needs to ask. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Throughout the Bible, you'll find people asking these very important questions. Our studies on Wednesday night will lead us to Job chapter 14. And uh, I think, in a sense, it's, it's almost the zenith chapter of Job, where Job poses the most important question ever asked. If a man die, shall he live again? So that's a question that everybody needs to ponder. He later answers it in the 19th chapter. For there he says, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this flesh, this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. So that was, Job understood, uh, he answered his own question. If a man die, will he live again? Or does he just go to the ground and become food for the worms? Now, if that's the case, and there's no life after death, if there's nothing beyond this world, then I suppose we might as well live any old way you want. And that's how immoral people live. They have no fear of God. They have no expectation of a life beyond. They have no fear of hell and no hope of heaven. And so at the end, they just go into the ground. So what would motivate them to live an altruistic life or a, even a righteous life of some kind, a morally right life? Really, there's no benefit to it. So you begin to understand why our society has become nihilistic, why we have mobs that have no fear of right or wrong, have no conception of what right or wrong is, and they just uh, go and do what they want, steal, loot, uh, burn things, burn our flag, and so on. All this because they're serving themselves, not the living God. So that was a great question and answered. Job gives the answer. In John chapter 3, we have a very religious man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus, as a ruler of the Jews, he's a member of the Sanhedrin. So uh, he's, uh, he's in the elite group of religionists in Jerusalem in the first century. But he's missing something too. And so he goes by night because he doesn't want people to see he's got a reputation here. Here he is going to this carpenter. That's how he, Jesus was considered just a carpenter. Uh, and uh, he was uh, not formally trained in the rabbinical schools. And yet Jesus had the power of the word of God in him. And so Nicodemus went with uh, a certain degree of inquisition. 
And Jesus surprises him. Uh, he said, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, Nicodemus says. And he stops him and says, um, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So he asked that question of Jesus, who said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And uh, so, well, how, how can this be? How can a man be born again? Now, that's a great question, isn't it? Because you're not going to heaven unless you're born again. So, how shall a man be born again? I give the illustration of George Whitfield, who was a mighty preacher of the Great Awakening here in America and in England. And uh, thousands would gather to hear him. Even Ben Franklin went to hear him. And uh, as far as a rhetorician, he was uh, unparalleled for his time. So people went to just hear him speak, whether they believed what he said or not. But uh, he held meetings for seven days, and each night he, uh, in one of these meetings he preached, um, you must be born again. And finally a fellow came up to him at the end of a service and said, Mr. Whitfield, I've been here for all seven meetings, and in every meeting you've preached the same message, that you must be born again. Why is it that you preach that message seven times? And Whitfield answered, because you must be born again. So it doesn't have to be uh, profound, folks. But how is a man born again? Well, uh, Nicodemus saw it from the physical. And that's always our mistake. Uh, Jesus said, that which is of flesh is flesh, but that which is of spirit is spirit. His words were spirit and life, he said. If you understand them in a physical context, you'll be nothing but confused. He's always speaking at a higher level, trying to take us to the next level. It's a spiritual rebirth. Until you are born again, you are dead in your sins and trespasses. Your spirit is dead. It died with Adam all those years ago back in the Garden of Eden. And it's revived in Christ the day he rose from the dead. And he can now impart to you a new spirit and engraft it into the soul through the power of his word. Amen. So he answers, Jesus said... Uh, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, some people say that's uh, water is baptism, but again, he's not speaking in the, in the physical, is he? Uh, that's Nicodemus' mistake. Perhaps he's even using the water as a symbol. I mean, when a person's born, they come out in a flood of water and blood, don't they? And unless you're born spiritually by the water and the blood, you can't go to heaven. So what water is he talking about? Later he says in John 15, 3, that the word of God has a cleansing power. Now ye are washed through the word which I have spoken unto you. So washed by the word of God, baptized by the Holy Spirit. Amen. So that's how he explains what would have to be a very complex idea in a very simple way. You must be born of water and of the Spirit. Another great question was posed in Matthew 27, 22. It was Pilate, the judge of Jesus, who said, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? Now we know in this particular context, he was asking the, the mob what they ought to do to Jesus, because he wanted nothing to do with condemning him. He found nothing wrong with him. He even washed his hands and said, I'm innocent of whatever happens to him. But Pilate posed before the people, what should I do with Jesus? Well, if we could take it out of context, it is a great question. Every man must answer it. What have you done with Jesus? You answer the question, what have you done with him? You can tell me that you've acknowledged him, but that's not enough to save you either. Many people acknowledged who he was. Uh, there are some today, atheists, that believe that there never was a Jesus, that it's all a fable and made up and so on. But it's one of the most provable facts of secular profane history, that Jesus walked the earth. So that's a ludicrous argument. But to say that you believe that he was a historical, that's not going to do you much good. You must not just believe in him, you must believe on him. So what shall I do with Christ, Pilate said. Well, Pilate decided to wash his hands of the matter. Many people decide that as well. They say, well, I don't really know what to think of him or what to... We need to understand and be able to answer this question definitively. What have you done with Jesus? Have you just acknowledged him or have you taken him into your heart? Have you, have you permitted him entry into the most secret chamber of human existence? Into your heart. Unless he's in your heart, you'll never go to heaven. 
invite him into your heart if you are not saved. So uh, the crowd decided that day, they said, let him be crucified. That was their decision. It was a damnable choice. And for all that say, let him be, we don't care about him. We don't believe his claims. We don't believe that he is God in the flesh. Let him be crucified. And that's what that mob was saying that day. And they got their wish. Another question was posed in Acts chapter 2. Now when they heard Peter preaching, and this was at the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost had come upon him. This same man, 50 days before this, was swearing and denying that he didn't even know Jesus. Is now filled with the Holy Ghost. Jesus has forgiven him and now will set him up as the, uh, the beginning of the church. And so he preaches at Pentecost where 3,000 people will be saved. And they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? So we hear the message, but what shall we do? They felt convicted, pricked in their heart. When the gospel goes out in power, we feel convicted about our sin. We know we're not living right. Something is wrong with your life. And you need a change. And so you might ask the question, Lord, what shall I do? When uh, Saul of Tarsus was uh, taken from the saddle to the desert floor that day, blinded with the light of the glory of God, he looks up to heaven, he says, Who art thou? And he hears the words from Jesus, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Why kickest thou against the pricks? And Saul's answer at that point is, Lord, what shall I do? What will you have me to do? And uh, Jesus saves him, and Jesus anoints him. He becomes Paul the Apostle and the writer of 13 epistles and gives us uh, so much to think about. Amen. So here, what shall we do? And Peter answers them. He said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, that you might receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now again, baptism appears here in this text, and this in this case has to be the physical water, but it's not a saving power. There are those that argue, I was baptized as an infant. Really? Uh, tell me what it was like. Tell me what you believed at that moment when you were baptized as an infant. Tell me what confession of faith you made. Well, you made none because you were an infant. Pedo-baptism or infant baptism is uh, it's an invention of the Roman Catholic Church and it's been followed by other Protestant churches like the Presbyterian Church. They believe in pedo-baptism. But water doesn't save anybody. Water is a symbol of what happened internally, the cleansing that happened within. And so it's symbolized by the cleansing without, that's all. So a person shouldn't be baptized and really haven't been baptized until they've been immersed in water as a symbol of their old life, dead, buried, cleansed, and you're brought up out in newness of life. So when I baptize, and people are wondering, well, can I baptize people? I can baptize people, that's for sure. Uh, and we, we haven't baptized for a while since the coronavirus. But uh, I, I don't want somebody coming in there thinking that water is going to wash away their sin. It's the blood of Christ that washes your sin away. And that will be a symbol that you belong to Him. And it's a commandment from the Lord after you have believed Amen. to uh, secure by an act, a symbol, an ordinance, what you have done spiritually. Um, so Acts 16, 29, then he called for a light. This is the jailer. Remember, Paul and Silas are arrested at Philippi for preaching the gospel. And uh, God comes to deliver them at midnight. They began singing praises to God. And God heard that joyful sound. And he sent forth an earthquake and loosed their chains and opened the prison doors. And the warden comes running in, realizing he's about to lose all of his uh, committed. And so he... Uh, takes his sword out, ready to finish himself off, commit suicide. Put up your sword, Paul said, we're all here. And he came, called for a light, and he sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? All of this, in a sense, is the same question that the rich young ruler is asking. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Or what they asked at Pentecost, what shall we do? And uh, people want to know, what shall I do? What should I do? And this jailer is almost ready to kill himself and, as a result, go to hell. What shall I do that I might be saved? What shall I do? 
And uh, Paul answers, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now that's simplistic and really that's all that's necessary to understand, at least at the juvenile level, we must believe, not in but on. That means to give your life to. And that's really what he's going to tell the rich young ruler here at some point, that what's missing in his life is that he had another God in his life, and that was wealth. And that had to go, if you're going to follow Jesus, there can't be any other God before him. So believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just Jesus Christ, but the Lord, that he is God from heaven, that he is the Yahweh of the Old Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. I like the word saved, don't you? So saved, what does it mean to be saved? Well, uh, saved means I'm helpless. Somebody has to come to my rescue. So that's why I like the word. In the Greek, it's sotir. And it just means to pluck, as, just like Peter, when he was, he was uh, going down for the count, you'll recall, Jesus was walking on the water, come to me, and Peter gets out of the boat, walks on the water, realizes I really can't do this, and begins to sink. Jesus reaches forth his hand and plucks him out of the water. That's salvation. He couldn't save himself. Jesus had to save and in the spiritual sense, there's none of us here that can save ourselves, but Christ can do the saving. And he can reach that arm down and pulls us up out of the water and saves our soul. So a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one. That is God. Now we look at this, and of course the skeptics that say that Jesus was just a man and not God say that he just admitted it. There's only one that's good. He's, he's not accepting that he's good. Well, that's not quite what he's saying here. So again, when you read the words of Jesus, we certainly need spiritual discernment. And we need God to help us to understand things that are complex. In many other places, John chapter 10, Jesus said outrightly, I and my Father are one. So we know that God is good, and if Jesus is one with the Father, he must be good. So why does he reject the title, good master here? Why does he say, well, no, no, there's none good. There's only one that's good, and that is God. Amen. Well, what's he doing here? I think that he's, he's helping the rich young ruler to come to an assessment. To this point, the rich ruler thinks, I'm talking to a rabbi. I'm talking to a good teacher. And that's all he's describing to him. That won't be enough to save him. He must see beyond the good teacher. And he was that. He's more than a good teacher. He is God in the flesh. But the rich ruler doesn't see that. Doesn't understand it. And so Jesus poses the question, well, why are you calling me good? What's, what's the reason that you call me good? Before I can accept the title, I need to know what you're thinking here. So in other words, is it because you think that a man can achieve goodness by keeping the law. Is that what you're thinking? Are you thinking that the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and the great rabbinical teachers, that they're good people and that they're going to go to heaven because they've kept the law? Is that what you're thinking? Is that what you are ascribing to me? Is that what you're ascribing to yourself? In which case, he must be a good rich young ruler because he's kept all of the law. Or is it because you recognize that I, that a good, uh, I'm more than a good master, that I am God in the flesh. So that's why he rejects the title for now. He's not going to accept it because he already understands what's in the heart of the rich young ruler. Again, he has, um, he's privy to the secret counsels of the heart. Something that you and I can never fathom. I can't look into your heart. I could say that you're saved. What good will that do you? It's, it's a personal matter. Only God can see what's in your heart and you. That's it. So Jesus here knows what's in the heart of the rich young ruler and knows that he is not saved and knows that this man thinks that by keeping the law, that's how you're going to go to heaven. And that's why he ascribes to Jesus just a good teacher. You're a follower of the law. You're a good teacher and so forth. He said, well, uh, I think his understanding is deficient. So... In Matthew 16, when Jesus came uh, to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? See, that was the question that's involved. Who, who, who do they think I am? 
Who did the rich young ruler think that Jesus was? Did he think that he was the son of the living God, the eternal I am, or did he just think he was another good teacher? Who do men say that I am? Well, immediately the disciples knew what the rumor was. They say, some say that thou art uh, John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah, Elias, uh, or Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then Jesus posed the question to them, but whom say ye that I am? Who do you think I am? And Peter immediately answers, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He had the answer. He knew what the answer was. You're not just a good teacher. You're not just the good master. You're God from heaven. You are the perfect one. So Jesus said, there's only one that's good, and that's God. So who do you think I am? And uh, the rich young ruler didn't know the answer. So uh, he straightly, in another passage in Luke chapter 9 that we discussed, he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing. So, so here is a curious thing. So Peter answers correctly, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, well, don't tell anybody that. Well, why, why wouldn't he want that to be published abroad? And here's what I believe the answer. And really the same thing that were happening right before our eyes with the rich young ruler. This is not a truth that we can compel people to believe. This is a truth that you must come to by your own surmisings. You must, by your own volitional choice, see who he is and believe for yourself. You cannot take another person's word for it. When Jesus in John chapter 4 was at, the, at Jacob's well at Sychar, the woman didn't know who she was speaking to, but Jesus said, if you knew who I was, you'd ask of me and I'd give you living water and you'd live forever. Evermore, Lord, give me that water. And uh, he said, go call your husband. You know the rest of the account. She runs back to Samaria. She says, I found a man that told me all things, whatever I have done, ha is not this the Christ? And the Samaritans heard her word, but that wouldn't be enough for their salvation. They had to know for themselves. So they went to meet Jesus, and when they met him, they said, Now we believe, for we have heard him ourselves. The rich ruler had to come to this conclusion for himself. He wasn't going to be told this. There are those that argue that Jesus never had said that he was the Son of God. I would say that's not true. He did in John chapter 10, and of course at his trial before the Sanhedrin, when they adjured him, the great high priest adjured him, are you the son of God or, or are you not? And he said, I am. And that settles the case also. But he normally didn't. In fact, he wanted people to come to the conclusion for themselves. Whom do you say that I am? Again, it gets back to what will you do with Christ? Whose son was he? Who is he? And uh, if you can't answer that question, there'll be no entrance into heaven. So, you find Pilate interviewing Jesus here, and they entered the judgment hall again, and Jesus called Jesus, said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, same thing, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell this of me? Is this coming from your heart? Have you discerned that who I am? Or are you just listening to what others have said? And so Pilate answers, am I a Jew? You know, how do I? I don't know one way or the other is what he's basically answering. But Jesus put it to him again. He could have said, I am. Yes, that's who I am. But instead he said, is this something that's coming from your heart? Or is it something that you've heard? Beloved, listen, you cannot borrow my faith it don't have to be faith that you have for yourselves. You can't believe that Jesus is the living God just because I told you that. You must believe it for yourselves. And I believe that that's what this interrogation is all about. So Jesus, uh, the, uh, here's another in instance where the Jews came round about him and they said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Of course, their design was to trap him in that and to crucify him for making himself equal to God. Uh, so we know what their designs were. But Jesus does not 
He doesn't bow to their wishes at this point. He insists that they seek for themselves. Seek and ye shall find. How true it is. And in fact, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so, beloved, if you haven't diligently sought him, seek him now. Coming to church will certainly aid and help you in that. The word will be before you. The spirit is in the room. All of those uh, are here to assist you. But you must open your own heart and believe for yourselves. All right. So, um, so Jesus said, uh, why callest thou me good? None is good. So we go back to this expression, none is good. And the Bible asserts this in so many places, none are good. So here we have in Romans 3.12, they are all gone out of the way and together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And we're going to qualify this in just a bit. But in the meantime, this is what the scripture asserts in other places. Ecclesiastes 7.20, for there is not a just man that doeth good and sinneth not. Can't be found anywhere on earth. Uh, Psalm 14.1, they are corrupt, they have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. So uh, that uh, seems to be an open shut case. So it's, it's pretty clear what Jesus was saying here. So if that's the case, that none are good, why, um, what are we actually talking about here but absolute goodness? We're talking about perfection. There is none perfectly good. But God. In fact, the word good is nothing more than a conflation of the word or the name God. It's just another O that's added to it. And if you go to your uh, dictionaries or if you go to uh, whatever sources you have and you check this out, you'll see what I'm talking about. The word good and goodness has come from the name of God. That's why you'll never hear me use the expression, my goodness. Because I believe that's profaning the name of God when people say that. And you don't want to use God's name in vain. So uh, I want to be careful about using that because I know what goodness means. And uh, there is no goodness without God. It all comes from Him. Absolute goodness. Absolutely good. So when you hear people accusing God, what kind of a God, and you can fill in the blank after that, it's a, a disgusting uh, epithet. Then you hear people demonically mimicking it, saying, well, if God is a loving God, if God is this, if God... Listen, God is a loving God. God is absolutely good. You're not going to put, don't put any moral uh, evil upon God. He is totally good. So if you're not understanding his ways, if you're not understanding why he permits evil, I wouldn't put the charge to God if I were you. That's a foolish thing to do. So God is absolutely good. And that's what Jesus means is, is, is this expression. But there is such a thing as relative goodness. It's the same that we have with the word perfect. I think it was Wednesday night uh, that we went into this. Certainly was because God calls Job perfect, doesn't he? You say, perfect? There's not a man on earth that's perfect. Well, again, it's absolute perfection and relative perfection. So absolute goodness, only God is absolutely good. And in the person of Christ, absolutely purely good. Jesus could say rightly, I am the good shepherd in John chapter 10. So relative goodness, in Luke chapter 23, we have a man that's good. His name is Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just, but relatively good in the sense of you and I are hoping that one day Jesus will say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. So we're good in that sense. Not good, perfectly good, but good in a relative sense. Uh, and whenever God touches a person's life, he puts his goodness in us. There is the perfection of the Holy Spirit in every believing heart. And that's what it means in John 3 in that very difficult passage that says, He that is born of God doth not commit sin. Well, the born again part of you that is in you is absolutely good. That's the Holy Spirit. The problem is there's another nature in all of us, the old Adamic nature. And that part is corrupt. And that will be there until the day that we meet the Master. Then that part of us will be purged out. So, um, 
another illustration, and this could go on, is Barnabas, uh, then you should go as far as any, for he was a good man full of the Holy Ghost. So there are people in the Bible that are described as being good, but when we hear that expression, say, well, that, that's relative goodness, because those other passages that we already saw said there are no good. So what, uh, there's no contradiction in the Bible, it's just understanding the meaning of the words and, and where God was taking us in these things. So, thou knowest the commandments, Jesus said, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. Now Jesus carefully crafts his argument, prosecutes the case. He said, well, you know the commandments, but he doesn't mention the, what's called the first part of the Decalogue. You know, when, Je when Moses came down from the mount, he had two tables of stone. Uh, on the first uh, table of stone were the first four uh, aspects of the law, and then the last six on the other two. And uh, they often say, well, this has to do with the first four, have to do with man's relationship to God. And the last six, man's relationship to man. So it's horizontal and vertical. So the idea of the first four commandments has to do with the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, the first commandment says. So it all has to do with God, not to profane his name, not to make idols after him and so on, and to keep his day holy. So it was all about our, our position towards God. But then Jesus bypasses that. Because after all, that is the great issue. In Matthew 22, when a lawyer came and said, what's the great commandment? Jesus said, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. So that was the great commandment. It's our relationship to God first. And there's no way in the world that we're going to keep the other commandments unless we've first found the love of God, unless the love of God has permeated our soul and we are baptized by His Holy Spirit. Then there's no, there's no desire to do anything for others than ourselves. And even we'll cheat others uh, of our own ilk and our own uh, humanity. We'll, we'll commit fraud, we'll, we'll commit violence against them because there's no love of God that will constrain us to act according to His commandments. But those that were law keepers, and that's what the word Pharisee means, law keepers, rulers, in this case the rich young ruler, he may well have been a member of the Sanhedrin. So um, these were the last portions of the commandments. This is man's relationship to man. And, uh, well, of course, these commandments were perfect commandments. You remember in John chapter 8 that Jesus has a woman that had been taken in the act of adultery. And they brought uh, her out of the city limits to stone her to death. Mosaic law demanded death for adultery. So it was a serious matter, wasn't it? Still is, by the way. Uh, there's great mercy with our Lord. Otherwise, we'd have a lot of dead people right now committing adultery. But uh, God uh, was going to show her mercy, too. So she's brought out. The law demanded her death. But Jesus stooped down on the ground, you'll recall. He began writing something on the ground that the Bible doesn't tell us what it was. So uh, they continued asking him. He lifted up himself and said unto them. They said uh, to Jesus, the law says she should be condemned. What do you say? And he doesn't say anything. Instead, he stoops down, he's writing on the ground, something cryptically, but apparently was something they could see and they could understand. And when he was done writing, he stood up and he said, he that is without sin, let him cast the first stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now, there was something that the Pharisees knew, and that was that there wasn't one amongst them that hadn't sinned. There's no one that could say, just like this rich young ruler is boasting, I've kept all of that from my youth up. And yet when Jesus said, if, you've not, if you haven't sinned, then you'd be the first one to cast the stone. You'd be in a position to judge her then. But uh, the problem, of course, was that there wasn't found a man that could say, I have not sinned. So they had to, they had to search their own conscience. They had to realize for themselves that they had themselves sinned as all men have. No one gets saved who doesn't first admit that they have sinned against God, and that that sin is damnable. And so they must confess, I'm a sinner, Lord. We just learned last week, and just above this teaching, we have the other parable of the Pharisee and the publican. They both go up to pray, and one's a Pharisee and one's a, a publican. The, the publican doesn't even look up to heaven, he smotes his breast, God be merciful to me, a sinner. 
And Jesus said, that man goes down to his house justified, and not the other, the Pharisee doesn't. Because he's acknowledged that he has fallen short of the glory of God. He has sinned. He is not good. He needs the goodness of God to change his life. So uh, this writing on the ground convicts every one of them. They drop their stones and leave from the uh, eldest to the youngest. Not a one of them could uh, bring a stone against her of judgment. Well, the law, of course, was perfect. I'm thinking that that's what Jesus was scrawling on the ground with his finger. Well, remember that that's how God wrote the Ten Commandments when he gave them to Moses. It says in the book of Deuteronomy, he wrote with his finger in the stone. The fact that he's writing it now on the ground is uh, perhaps esoteric, and there's uh, some meaning to look behind that, but we won't get into that this morning. So there's the Ten Commandments. Can anybody be saved by keeping the law? Well, the rich ruler said, all these I've kept from my youth up. I must be in good steads. Is that all I have to do to be saved? And, uh, well, of course, the answer will come to us uh, as condemnation later. But we know that the Bible says that the law can't, the commandments, can't save you. It doesn't have the power to save you. It only really has the power to condemn us. It only has the power to awaken us to the awareness that we have broken God's law, that we are all violators and malefactors. And we must do something to ameliorate our condition with God. We come under conviction. Uh, every mouth is stopped. All the world becomes guilty before God. For by the giving of the law, there is the knowledge of sin. That's all that we have. Do I have that up there? Somewhere? Yeah, there it is. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's all it can do is tell us that we have sinned against him. It can't justify us. It condemns us because all of us stand as breakers of the law. None are good. No, not one. And so when he answers, well, all these I've kept from my youth up. It's a cavalier way. Of, he thought he had it all figured out. And really he didn't. Because you may have it all on the outside figured out, but what about the inside? And Jesus even said, it's been said of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, he that looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already in his heart. Well, that would put every man under condemnation. Why would Jesus say such a thing? To let us all know that the law is more than just an external keeping of it. That God expects it to be even in the heart and in the motivations of man. We stand in awe of God's pureness and holiness. And we say, there is none good but God. I need someone to cover my sins. And so Jesus comes to our rescue and saves us. The Bible says that the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Uh, I don't even think they have truant officers anymore, do they? They probably don't even care where the, the kids go or they don't go to school. But Galatians tells us, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. And this word is a very curious word, a very important word for us to look into a little deeper. Schoolmaster. Well, we would normally ascribe that to the person that's doing the teaching, but that's really not what this is. Uh, it's, we have an English word, pedagogue, and it's taken from the Greek roots here. And this word simply means, um, if you go back to, uh, I use Vine's expository dictionary, but there are many lexicons you could look this up and, and see what I'm saying. So this word uh, means uh, the idea of instruction, is, it's absent. In this, and allied words, that the idea is that of training, discipline, not of impartation of knowledge. So the pedagogue was not the instructor of the child. He exercised a general supervision over him, was responsible for his moral and physical well-being. Now we can look back to Greek pottery and bas relief and all this sort of thing, and we begin to we see the, the role of the pedagogue. And what was he? Well, what he was literally was uh, he was hired by the parent to make sure that the child went to school. A truant officer. He made sure, well, now, you know as well as I do, if you say, okay, little Johnny's going to go to school today. We packed your lunch. Here are your school books. And he's on his way. He waves goodbye. And what does he do? He tucks under the circus tent. Does he go to the circus? Or he goes into Forbes Field and watches the ball game and skips school. Uh, nobody would be the wiser. Well, except that there are truant officers that made sure that you got there. And the Greeks did the same thing and made sure that the schoolmaster, the truant officer, made sure you got to school. And then he was hired to sit there while you were at school. And when you opened up your laptop, like the Greeks did, they had laptops in those days, the, the 
the pedagogue would stand there with his stick in his arm and he would make sure that you listened to the instruction and that you did your homework. If not, you got a couple raps on the head. Or if you began to fall asleep, we won't get into that right now because some of you are perilously close. They would wrap you on the head and make sure that you listened and received the instruction. The law, the commandments were a schoolmaster that had the rod in its hand and said, you're not listening, you're not understanding, and there's a punishment that's going to come to you. And that's all the schoolmaster was. The law brought us to Christ, who is the remedy. He is the end of the law of righteousness to everyone that believeth. And with that, we're going to stop, and I'll be back here tonight. I wish that you would come and fill my church up tonight. It would be inspiring to me. Let's pray. So I wonder tonight, Lord, who amongst us here is truly saved? Only the individual can search his heart. It's really not our business. Ours is to put forth the truth the best that we can. The Holy Spirit is here to guide and to lead us. The law of God stands on the other side as a con condemnation, waiting to punish us because we're all malefactors. We've broken that law. None are truly good. And so, Lord, we're glad to come to the fulfiller of the law, the one who came and lived the law perfectly, inwardly and outwardly, the Lord and Savior, the end of the law of righteousness for him that believeth. You said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. You did this for us, Lord. Now, this law that's perfect, holy and good, we were enemies to it until now, and now it's been written in our hearts. And now with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can through His goodness achieve some level of obedience. For faith without works is dead being by itself. We understand this. And even to the woman that was saved from the wrath that she deserved because of her act of adultery, you saved her but said, go now and sin no more because the power of mercy and forgiveness is dwelling in us. We now have a desire to please you in the law that you gave that was for our own good, Lord. And now with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can at least to some level obey you. Give us now that desire in our hearts as we leave this place, Lord. And if I'm speaking to you this morning and you are not saved, come to the cross of Jesus. Come near, bring your life with all of its burdened sin and lay it at the feet of the cross. The living God has sent his son. He has come in person to ameliorate your sin and your terrible record. He's come to save, to seek and to save you. We'll find tonight that he loved this rich young ruler. The Bible tells us this, he loved him. He wanted him saved, but that salvation would be something that would escape this rich ruler because there was another God in his heart. Let us tear down all idols, beloved, and let us decide this morning, it's Jesus. Jesus, my Lord and my Savior. Come into my heart, forgive me of my sin, wash me in your blood, and give me now the power of your spirit. We'll thank you now and we will thank you throughout eternity in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I hope to see you again soon. Have a blessed day. We invite you to accept the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God, that you have sinned against Him. You can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended Him. He has the record, and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin if it goes without atonement, 
we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. On the third day, in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Come in to